recording now, so the system is recording, so we can play this back if, uh, if anyone's interested in, in the future or at a later date to watch and uh, review the system. So today, um, CC Boot Camp, uh, we're providing a webinar on CUBE, Cisco Unified Border Element. Uh, my name is Larry Metzger, and I'm the uh, lead instructor for Unified Communications with CC Boot Camp. And my CCIE number is 13937. I am voice as well as route switch. So I do have a, a pretty strong background um, within the CCIE world. Uh, I've been working in this area for quite some time and uh, definitely been uh, heavily involved uh, within the training aspects and whatnot. So technical instructor consultant. And uh, again, if you uh, have questions, I will be uh, ref referring to the questions area. Uh, once we're done with the session, we'll have a full Q&A, so everyone will have a chance to ask questions. So at this time, I'll go ahead and continue on with uh, what we're going to cover. So the agenda for today is going to be just an introduction to CUBE. What is CUBE? What's it all about? Why is it important to us? Uh, then we'll move into talking more in depth about SIP to SIP and SIP to H323 with uh, Cisco Unified Communications Manager as well as Communications Manager Express. Uh, we'll, we will do a demonstration. I've got a a small setup of equipment um, just to demo how CUBE works, what it does, and how it functions. And then we'll have a Q&A session at the very end. So again, um, you'll be able to ask your questions. Uh, if you post your questions during the session, I may not be able to see them. I'm just trying to keep up with all the things here. Um, but uh, we will have the ability to review that information and, and talk about it at the very end. So just to start, uh, talking about CUBE functionality. So CUBE is basically how we interconnect a VoIP, VoIP network. So we're going to bring in the capabilities of allowing uh, two separate voice over IP systems to talk to one another. Um, CUBE is also known by several different names. And in the old days, uh, we used to call it an IP to IP gateway or a session border controller. Cisco came out with the, the name of Unified Border Element. So it offers some features that may not have been available in the older operations. But um, CUBE is not a whole new technology. It's something that's been around for years. Uh, it's in our old um, iOS code as an IP to IP gateway or a session border controller. It's uh, available through the iOS. So from that standpoint, you know we uh, implement it on Cisco iOS gateways. So that would be you know your 1700 series, 1800 series, 2900, 3900, 7200 series. And I'll give you a slide that sort of lays out um, what the functionality and performance of each of those series would look like uh, within your environment, so the scalability of the solution. It also gives us uh, the ability to connect VoIP dial peers. So we have multiple VoIP dial peers, again, being able to bring in different options, different protocol communications. So as shown here, we have H323 to SIP, H323 to H323, or H, uh, SIP to SIP. So within our, our VoIP environment, uh, we do have that ability to, to communicate different protocols. Um, it will allow you to communicate not only different protocols, but also different codecs. Uh, the different codecs will require transcoding to occur, but you can communicate not only different uh, control protocols, but different codecs within the VoIP communication. So CUBE gives us a lot of functionality that just wasn't uh, something that people were aware of because providers traditionally didn't have this ability. So most companies, when they were using IP to IP gateways or CUBE in the past, were using it because they were internally communicating different VoIP networks. Now with the um, service riders out there being able to give us SIP trunks into our companies or into our business, that gives us a lot more features that we can utilize. Uh, so it's not just an internal thing. It's how we connect to the PSTN, to the outside world, um, beyond the walls of our, our company or our organization. So this is just a showing of what this looks like. So either SIP or H323, it connects to our IP IP gateway. So this is our gateway in the middle. Um, as you can see, we've got an IP to IP gateway, which could be any of the routers that support the voice capabilities. Um, and we can communicate from either side inbound VoIP dial peer. So as it comes into this gateway, we're going to have an inbound VoIP dial peer. And with all dial peers within a, a gateway, whether it's a, a regular PSTN connected gateway or an IP to IP gateway, we have to have an inbound and an outbound dial peer. <clears throat> and those dial peers are what determine how we communicate, whether it's a SIP inbound to a SIP outbound, 
or an H323 inbound to an H323 outbound. So this is going to give us that functionality being able to communicate from one side of our network to the other side of our network. Um, again, just a, a picture to depict that so you can see what's going on. So why do we want Q? Why is this border element um, so important to us these days? Well, because we have the ability to deal with our session management. So on the left-hand side here, you can see real-time session management. Call admission control. We can, we can control what calls are allowed, how they get from point A to point Z um, as they go through our network. Uh, of course, we want to put quality of service on them, so QoS features. Uh, gateway fallback, so we have the ability for uh, PSTN failovers. Uh, statistics and billing, as well as redundancy and scalability. One of the nice things about using an IP to IP gateway is we're not as tied to physical hardware as we are with, a, say, T1 PRI or other method of connecting to a PSTN where we're limited by the channels that we've got. With a, a cube solution, um, the scalability is much bigger within the actual routers or the gateways. Uh, over on the left-hand bottom side there, we can look at um, our interworking. So again, looking at uh, what can we do with this. Um, we've got H323 to SIP, SIP to SIP, SIP normalization. We can deal with DTMF, the dual tone uh, multi-frequency, so your, your buttons as you press them. How do we do DTMF, being able to convert between different DTMF tones, uh, different solutions there. Transcoding, again, as I mentioned, we have the ability to use uh, G711 to G729, different codecs. And using a transcoding implementation, we would be able to fulfill um, the functionality between uh, disparate systems that otherwise would not be able to talk. And you can do fax and modem support, so it does support those things. Other nice features about it, the demarcation. So this gives us the ability to sort of um, create some interface between us and our carrier. By using a Cisco Unified Border Element, we're going to terminate those calls, the real-time protocol streams, the RTP stream, is going to be terminated on this device, which prevents the one side of the world from seeing the other side of the world. So we don't have to have our carrier be able to see everything within our network. We don't need to see everything within the carrier network. We can hide behind this demarcation and just communicate between the endpoints. So it gives us that topology, topology hiding opportunity. Um, different uh, protocol demarcations, as well as our, our statistics and billing from it. Dealing with security, we have some ability to do some encryption, authentication, uh, registration, and really uh, the ability to avoid toll, f and f toll fraud. Um, so there's a lot of features within the security aspects of this solution as well that prevent um, the inherent uh, unknowns within our data network. So the IP network can be hacked down pretty easily, but this cube will allow us to put sort of that that demarcation between us and the outside world, which gives us some security and some levels of, of control over what's going on within our network. So other reasons why we want to do this? Well, looking at uh, the solution, it's a lower cost. If we're dealing with T1 PRIs or other methods of connecting to our carriers, we're looking at a lot of cost. Every time we want to add more, we're adding more as far as uh, connectivity. So that PRI is costly, and we have to keep adding PRIs. With Cube, to increase, it's just a matter of scalability. It's a data network connection. So for the most part, it's a lot cheaper these days to get data connections, and then we run SIP trunks across them, and that's going to be a lot cheaper than if we try to put in more and more T1 PRIs. It's more flexible. I can change how this comes into my network. I can change locations that it comes into my network, which brings us to the next point, which is a real big one for me, um, is the site redundancy. I've had several customers where I've rolled this out for them and be able to provide them site redundancy for their inbound and outbound. Um, you know when you're dealing with T1 PRIs, uh, you're, you're dealing with the ability to have DID rollover only when that PRI connects to the same switch within your, your service provider. If you're trying to do site-to-site -site redundancy for DIDs, you can't. All you can do is roll to a single number. With Cube and SIP trunks, we can actually do DID redundancy across your network, have multiple ways into your network, um, as well as allow for uh, out-of-area um, uh, DIDs, so we're not having to deal with, you know, in Texas we have to have a PRI to get our DIDs for Texas, or you have to pay an exorbitant amount of money to have those DIDs uh, shipped over to another location and brought into your network. 
with SIP. It's very easy to do and, and very simple. Again, the scalability is huge. Um, just being able to increase the number of lines, the number of links, how many calls we can handle, um, really a big deal, and ease of deployment. When you're deploying the solution, I'm going to show you that there's really only a handful of commands that you need to do to set it up, and the functionality is very easy to deal with. Um, so here's just sort of a, a diagram to lay out what this looks like for you. So I'll try to highlight some pieces here. So we've got our site here in San Jose, and we've got a call manager cluster. So in the middle of this, we've got our cube gateway. And the cube gateway is the only thing that has to communicate with the SIP carrier. So again, this could be an H323 to SIP, or it could be a SIP to SIP. Uh, it doesn't have to be one or the other. We, we could change this to H3, or from H323 to SIP very easily. But the idea is that we've got our carrier on the outside, and we've got, here's one location, but through our IP WAN, we are able to get a remote site. Still, everything just comes through one SIP connection. So I've got a lot of customers I've worked with rolling this out, again, with those DIDs for the remote sites. Um, they can support those all through one inbound connection and with minimal cost and easy scalability. So I don't have to have SIP trunks coming in every site like I did with T1 PRIs, where I had to have PRIs coming into each and every location. Here, I've got one connection to my carrier. I can bring that in. If I wanted to have multiple connections and create redundancy, I can do that as well. So I could have a connection in San Jose and, say, one uh, in New York. And those would be my two SIP trunk connections. And then everything else basically would be remote sites that don't have to have any sort of um, connectivity to the carrier. So we wouldn't have to have service provider connections at each and every location. Makes the solution very scalable, very easy to manage and maintain, and uh, really a, a large scale functionality. Continuing on, just uh, looking at what we can do with Cube and how it functions. Um, looking at Cube's functionality, you'll see that we have the ability for media flow through, which this is our standard operating procedures. This is where our signaling comes from one side, from one connectivity type, whether it's H323 or SIP. And we have signaling going to the other side, again, H323 or SIP. And in between sits our IP to IP gateway. Now in this media flow through, we've got the IP phone on the left-hand side, this 10.1.1.1. It's going to communicate with the IP gateway. The IP gateway is going to terminate that call. So that call will actually end RTP stream on that gateway. Another call will basically be picked up between that gateway and the phone on the other side. So um, the other side can also be IP address is 10.1.1.1. And there's no problem with this sort of a setup and configuration because the two phones don't know about each other. They have no idea what's going on or how to get from point A to point C. And we'd be doing NATing on the back side of this. So the IP to IP gateway obviously has to have some methodology to communicate with that different phones um, because obviously we can't have one device talking to two 10.1.1.1 um, IP addresses. But we have the ability to mask that. So from the phone standpoint, the phones have no idea that they're the exact same address. They're completely separate. They are terminating their calls strictly to this IP to IP gateway, and that's called media flow through. We also have the ability to do media flow around. What this does is this basically means that our signaling is going to all go through on our IP to IP gateway. So our H323 or SIP is going to signal through, but we're going to allow the media to avoid going through our IP to IP gateway and actually have media establish directly from one phone to the other phone. This solution might be something that you would want to use within your organization, um, dealing with a uh, call setup if you've got numerous uh, communications managers or uh, different VoIP um, gateway providers and things of that nature. You may need to control the, the signaling through an IP to IP gateway, but you may not need to terminate RTP within it, um, which would give you a little more scalability as well because we aren't having to deal with the fact that um, this IP IP gateway is terminating every call and generating another call and dealing with those RTP streams or transcoding. We'd have the phones talking directly. Of course, this isn't quite going to work if we're dealing with our uh, service providers because service providers definitely we don't want our, our endpoints communicating directly across. So looking at scalability um, within the solution, if you look at uh, the scalability, everybody always asks me, well, how many calls or how many uh, trunks can I support? 
with the cube, Cisco Unified Border Element. What can I do with this? And, and the problem is that there's two factors that go into scalability on the solution. Actually, three if we, we get into transcoding. Um, the factors that really emphasize here are, are active calls. So we have active voice calls. That's our capacity of the device. And then we have our um, calls per second. So these are how many calls are we trying to handle? How many calls are we trying to deal with per second? So that's our setup. That deals with that signaling. So whether we're dealing with H323 or SIP, as we bring those calls in, how, how big and fast does the device have to be underneath in order to handle the calls that we expect? So for most companies and most businesses, you're looking in this range down here, you're 2800, 2900. That's reasonable. You can see that we can handle five to 600 active calls in this range, um, eight to 12 calls per second of setup. That's pretty reasonable for most businesses. As you start to get larger and you move into the larger call, call volumes, you can go to the 3900 or an ASR, or all the way up to the ASR 1004, um, which is pretty obnoxious, 12 to 16,000 uh, sessions. Um, I don't know of too many organizations that needs that kind of support in a single box, obviously. Scalability on this, you can put in multiple cube devices, so you don't have to just stick with one if you go beyond the capacity of one. You'd want redundancy not only in your connectivity to the outside world, but also in the device itself, so you'd want to have multiple of the devices. So this just gives you kind of a feel and an idea. Now the third thing that I was mentioning before is the transcoding. So obviously, if we're going to be transcoding uh, 729 to 711 codecs, our transcoding resources are going to play a, a huge part in this um, scalability of the solution. So this is really this scalability uh, diagram that I've got here on screen is showing you we're talking about a standard um, codec on each side going through the device. So codec filtering, so we are able to uh, do some codec filtering where we do negotiating. So when we negotiate a codec, here you'll see that we're going to negotiate G729 coming from the left side. It's going to negotiate through the IP to IP gateway and hook up G729 on the other side. So we're going to negotiate the communication. The other option we have is for the devices just to directly negotiate and we put the gateway in transparent mode and it's just going to transparently accept um, the codec that's being negotiated by the two end devices, so it's not really involved in that negotiating process. So that's called codec filtering on Cube, and uh, uh, it's just a choice that you make when you configure the device. Um, again, on your dial peers, you can change this configuration on your dial peer, so that's how you'd handle which solution you want to do. So at this point, just to make sure that I've got people still uh, involved with me and, and uh, not falling asleep completely, I'm going to go ahead and do another poll. So I just want to check in with uh, everybody and see um, if everybody's awake first off and if everybody uh, has an idea of what do we call um, uh, a cube solution, what are our other names for cube, uh, IP doorway, IP to IP gateway, voice access gateway, session border controller, and there's multiple answers to this solution. And it looks like uh, most people are uh, on, on the ball here. And uh, I guess I'll go ahead and close that because I think we've got pretty much everybody answering. There, hang on. Okay. Yeah, I got pretty much everybody answering there, so I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. So, of course, the two answers were IP to IP gateway and session border controller. I had those up on that uh, slide moments ago. Uh, on this slide, there's even IP to IP gateway, so you should have had at least one of the two correct. Um, voice access gateway, that's obviously, you could call it a voice access gateway, but it's not a, a, a definition of what Cube is. Cube is session border controller or IP to IP gateway. So everybody did really well on that. Good to see everyone's still awake out there, too. That's great to see. Um, I did see that we have a few questions uh, coming in. And again, I'm going to be answering all questions at the, uh, at the end of the session. Um, and I'll continue on here. So now that I've got that closed, you should still be seeing my screen. And I'll just make sure of that. OK, so how do we get in and actually start this whole thing up? Well. The main thing to do when you're trying to configure 
an IP to IP gateway cube session border controller is you need to start the system to allowing that. So um, you need to go into voice service VoIP and type the simple command allow connections from and to. So this is really all we're looking to do. We need to allow the connections and we put in which from option we want and what to option we want. And again, this is a unidirectional solution. So what does that mean by unidirectional? If I were to say from SIP to H323, then that means my inbound is allowed to be SIP and my outbound is allowed to be H323. If I want to allow H323 to SIP, I have to turn on that connection going the opposite direction and say allow connections H323 to SIP. So I need to call out both of them. So let's uh, look at an H323 to H323 internetworking scenario. Again, um, we can have lots of different options here, but we've got a San Jose site and a Chicago site. We got Cisco Unified Communications Manager on one side, and we got Communications Manager Express on the other side. In between, we've got an IP WAN, and on the IP WAN, all we want to do is communicate H323, and on the uh, San Jose site, we're going to con communicate with H323. And we're going to terminate those calls on this IP to IP gateway. So basically, this would happen, say, um, you're partnering with a company and you want to be able to communicate between your device and their device, or uh, your organization has just acquired another company, and the other company already has some pieces, parts in place, and you're not ready to fully integrate them into your Cisco Unified Communications Manager um, within your, your company's network. So you're in the early stage of acquisition, and you're going to be integrating them in some future date. At least I would hope you would. That would make a lot of sense. Um, but in the meantime, you want to be able to allow them to communicate with you directly, but uh, just a simple integration can be done with an IP to IP gateway or cube. So that's basically what this looks like. And I'll continue on and show you how, how we would set this up. So to configure it, we need to first enable H323 to H323 interworking. So we're going to allow H323 to H323 to H323. And then we're going to configure our dial peers, because that cube device has to know how to get from one side to the other. So pretty simple process. Here's all you have to do, all right? First thing we start off with is voice service VoIP and allow connections H323 to H323. Congratulations, you've just turned on Cube. You're allowing a VoIP dial peer to talk to a VoIP dial peer. Pretty amazing, right? That's all it took. Two command lines, and we've turned on Cube. We have an IP to IP gateway. Now, to actually allow this uh, to become something bigger and better, well, you need dial peers. So we have dial peers uh, that allow us to communicate from one side to the other. So we've got uh, two CUCM. We're calling out what uh, destination pattern goes that direction and where it goes. And then we have a two CUCME destination pattern, which would allow it to communicate, and then the IP address of where it's going to. Now at the bottom there, I mentioned if you want to make this SIP, um, all you have to do is add session protocol SIP v2 to make it a SIP dial here. So not a miracle there, and we'll walk through that in just a moment. But uh, I just want to show here that you do have that ability to make this anytime someone dials a two um, dot, dot, dot. So 2,000 to 2,999, we're going to send it this direction. Whenever someone dials a 3,000 to 3,999, um, we'll send it to CUCME. We now have the ability to communicate uh, within our cube solution. We turned on H323 to H323. We've got a pair of H323 dial peers, and we are now functional as a cube gateway. I know everyone's looking for the miracle, right? That's it. That's all the mojo. That's the whole excitement there. So looking at the next slide here, we've got um, basically the same thing, except now we're going to be talking SIP. So within the SIP option, we've got our call manager here. We've got our SIP carrier on the right. And we've got cube in between. So when we go in and we want to um, make this communication, all we're going to do is convert at that cube gateway from H323 to SIP, so that way we can have a SIP carrier out there. Um, most companies out there and most uh, users and engineers uh, would probably prefer to just go ahead and run SIP on their side on the communications manager, so you could do a SIP to SIP as well. Really doesn't matter. It's not a huge difference within the router. The cube device, as I showed on the other page, all we do is change the uh, session protocol to SIP, and we're done. Um, so I'll just go ahead and continue on and show you what this looks like. So we're going to enable H323 to SIP interworking. 
And then we're going to configure H323 and SIP dial peers. And there we go. So it does take a little more to allow uh, the H323 to SIP because, as I mentioned last time, it is unidirectional. So when we say voice service VoIP and we allow H323 to SIP, that's unidirectional. That means our inbound can be H323 and our outbound can be SIP. We need to allow the other solution, which is SIP inbound to H323 outbound. So once we've done this, again, we now have an H323 to SIP interworking. So we are able to function and communicate. That's great. And then we create our dial peers. So within our dial peers, if we go in and create our call manager dial peer, this one shows up as a, an H323. We've got the two dot dot dot, which allows our 2000 to 2999. And it's going to go using DTMF relay of H2, H245 alphanumeric. So our DTMF we're going to handle uh, in that methodology. And then to an international SIP carrier, we want to call out how we're getting there. So we have a 9011T, so that's our destination pattern that we're going to send. Um, when we see that, we're going to send to the IP address located here in the IPv4. And we have a DTMF here, which is RTP NTE. So this is what uh, allows us to function and communicate on our dial peers. So we now have configured an H323 to uh, SIP. Continue on, some things that we can do. I mentioned earlier about the uh, media flow and transparent codecs. Just a couple of commands as far as the dial peer goes. So media, flow around or flow through. The default is going to be flow through, so we're going to be in control. And we can change that to flow around if we care to. Uh, as far as codec uh, transparent, we can have our codec um, pass through on, on the dial peer. And you just simply add the codec transparent on the dial peer. And then we would just be tr uh, transparently uh, sending codec between the two endpoints. So how do we configure that? Again, looking at our diagram of our San Jose site and our Chicago site, we want to make sure that we have a direct codec negotiation and that we send our direct RTP stream. Again, in this situation, we may not be uh, trying to hide or mask who we are. We're just trying to deal with the call control, and the call control is going to be why we're using the, the uh, IP IP gateway or the cube solution in this situation. So here's the configuration, the changes we added. We had a couple of minor changes here, and that would be the codec transparent and the media flow around to the dial peers. Notice again that this is only done on the dial peers. So we really haven't changed anything anywhere else within our cube solution, we're changing on the dial peer. So this is a per dial peer configuration option um, within the system. So since I've been talking for quite some time, I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and check to see if I can find uh, any questions and see if people had anything out there. So um, trying to bring up the questions. All right, well, I'm going to turn off my showing of the screen and see if I can bring up the questions. And, um, not having any luck bringing up the questions right now. Bear with me while I see if I can find the questions here. There we go. Um, Bear with me. There's just a few questions here, and I'm clicking through, and some are are uh, just responding to me, and, and they're not really questions. So, uh, is the SBC required with SIP trunk service? Um, so, if you're getting a SIP trunk service from your your service provider, uh, then a cube or, or a, an SBC, a session border controller, cube IP to IP gateway, typically is required. Um, the main reason for that is you wouldn't want to directly connect, say, your communications manager and all your IP phones on the back side um, into your service provider. 
because remember, RTP streams must be from endpoint to endpoint. So if you're going to be connecting to a, a SIP trunk with a service provider, uh, typically you don't want that service provider knowing all of your internal network and being able to see your internal network, even if it's just your voice network. So you would use a cube solution, and that's, that's the key to why this has become such a big ordeal recently. Um, the reason it's become such a big ordeal is because many of us are finding that uh, the carriers are, are providing SIP trunks um, for great price, for a, a solution that really gives us some performance. And so we're, we're looking at going to SIP trunks. So Cube is, has become a, a key issue because of that. Um, will the slides be available for download? Uh, no, we are recording the session, so you will be able to go back and review the uh, session. Um, you might be able to get uh, the slides. I, I might be able to share them uh, with you um, after the session, but they're not easily downloadable from the site, and I can see what uh, what availability we can make for those if people are interested. Um, another question is, do you need DSPs for Cube? Uh, DSPs are not required for Cube. The configurations I've shown so far uh, do not require them. Uh, that's because I'm communicating the same um, protocol, G729 on each side or G711 on each side, so the codec is the same going across. If I were to try and do G711 on one side of my uh, communication and G729 on the other, I would need a transcoding, in which case DSPs are required. So they're not required inherently, but if you're trying to actually communicate between uh, different codecs, you will have to have them. Okay. Uh, there was a question about the 500, 600 call capacity, uh, media flow through or flow around. That would be with media flow through. Um, obviously, uh, media flow around would require less resources because we're strictly dealing with a call setup. All right. With that, I'm going to go ahead and go back to uh, sharing what's on my screen here. And I'll continue with some more questions later, but I just thought I'd uh, answer some because I, I noticed that there were several building up. I didn't want to leave anybody hanging. So I'll come back and answer more uh, at the end of the session. So this just uh, shows us our verification. Hang on, did I skip one? Yep, there we go. Uh, how do we verify what's going on within our, our solution and within um, the cube environment? So there are some key commands that we have in here, and those are the show SIP call. This will allow us uh, within our, our device, whether we're on the um, a Call Manager Express or what have you, uh, or on the cube itself, we can show the SIP call. So this will allow us to see what calls are set up. We can show H323 Gateway, H225. This is going to show our call setups. Uh, so we can see what has been set up by the device. So our cube um, gateway is going to show information here, as well as just show H323 Gateway. Show voice call status. Now on, on the cube device, you won't see anything with this. When you do a show voice call status, you're going to get nothing um, because it's not dealing with initiating a call. Uh, if you're on a CME device, you will see the call status um, when calls are placed. So I'll show this command on both so you can see how that looks uh, within our lab environment that I'm going to show you in just a moment. Uh, the one that's really helpful is this show VoIP RTP connections. Um, you can use the uh, details option there to show a, a deeper information and to give you more details about the solution. Um, this works really well for whether you're on the uh, CME gateway or you're on the actual uh, cube gateway, you'll be able to see exactly what RTP streams are being handled by the device. So that's a great command to show what's going on. Show call active voice. So this will show you what calls are active on the device. And we'll see this again both on, on the uh, cube and on the CME solution. Um, and then the debug dial peer. So if you want to see what dial peers are actually being hit by the calls, you can see your inbound and outbound dial peers. And you can do the debug dial peer voice all if you want to see all the information. It floods your uh, gateway pretty hard. So um, the in-out usually is, is a better solution. But if you want to see all the details, and really dig into why am I having a problem. Uh, typically, I find that if you're not getting your calls going across properly, the debug on the dial peers is a huge help because unless you've been around uh, H323 
in SIP configurations for a long time. Uh, most engineers don't fully understand the HTTP dial peers. When you do this debug, you can see which dial peer was it hit on the inbound, which dial peer was hit on the outbound, and you can truly understand what's going on within the gateway so you can, you can figure out where my problem is. And most of the time, the problem is that you haven't controlled the call well enough. Um, I'm actually, uh, as part of uh, uh, the CC Boot Camp program, I provide out uh, some monthly articles for our newsletter, and I've been writing some articles uh, regarding H323 dial peers because I find that most engineers don't fully understand dial peers, and, and it's something that the more you understand about it, the better off you'll be, especially for Cube. Cube, absolutely, you need to understand how your dial peers are functioning. How do I get in? How do I get out? Where is my call going? And you absolutely like everything within our network, we want to control it. So we want to be in control of how it comes into us and how it goes out. So I'm just going to show you what our demo network looks like. So this is uh, basically our corporate office. It's a Cisco Unified Communications Manager Express, and I use CME. Uh, because it's a little easier to show some of the uh, configurations on it and how I set up the dial peers on it, um, rather than following, showing a uh, communications manager where basically you'd see an H323 IP address or a, a SIP IP address and not much else. Um, and also it was uh, really fast and, and easy for me to set up in a, in a demo mode for you. Uh, then I'll have on here our cube router, so this would be our IP to IP gateway, and it's going to communicate across over into our theoretical SIP carrier. So I've got this set up as both H323 and SIP, depending on which phone number you dial. So I've got both H323 and SIP configurations um, on that uh, CME device, and I'll show you how those work. And I'll show you how the configuration is set up uh, within the cube, so you can see how that functions. And the other thing I'm going to show you is the fact that I've got this phone over here, uh, 2001, and an IP address that this uh, SIP carrier, uh, which is also Communications Manager Express, a CME device uh, in my network. For demo purposes, it represents the PSTN. Uh, the SIP device has no idea about the IP address of this phone, so obviously there's no way I could do a pass-through solution. I wanted to show that Cube has to terminate these calls. My RTP stream has to be terminated on the Cube device because the SIP carrier has no idea about this phone. And that's the way you'd want it in, uh, in your network, typically, as well. We, we don't want to open up our networks and show and, and give access to everything within our network to that provider. So this is the demo network and what it looks like. And now I believe the best option here is, um, wrong slide, now I need to break out and go into the actual demo portion. So within the demo portion, here's my uh, CME device. So as you can see, I've got a CME device uh, running on my network. And that device right now has a phone plugged in. And that phone number on that phone is uh, the 408-555-2001, with the extension actually being 2001. And I'm going to go ahead and bring this up. And I'm going to dial a phone number. And you can hear that uh, I'm getting a failed call. That's because I haven't configured Cube yet. So at this point, I can do a show e-phones on this device. You can see that I do have a phone hooked into this. It's at address of 192.168.120.20. It's a Cisco 7961 device. And I can do a show IP route. So you can see on here, I've got the 120 network, the dot .1 and the dot .2. So 192.168.1, 192.168.2, 192.168.1, 192.168.2, 192.168.1. I have no knowledge of the 192.168.3 network within this configuration, so the CME device can't see the other side, which is exactly what we wanted. We want to make sure that they can't see what's going on. On the cube device, I can do a show IP route, and what you'll see here is it does know about the .1, the .2, the .3, as well as the, the 120. It has to know about the 120 network because it is going to terminate the call going to that phone. So it has to know about that phone. So the cube device has to know about my network on my side, has to know about whatever it's going to talk to on the other side, but it is the demarcation point between me and the other side of the world. So uh, as you can see, it does, and I'm just going to do a show run and show you that 
this is just a basic router right now. It has an IP address. There's nothing configured on it. All we've got some interfaces. There are some T1 cards in them, but they're not lit up. They're just T1s sitting there um, for lab demo of other nature. As you can see, one static route, no other configurations, no dial here, so there's nothing up my sleeve. Now I'm going to show you what the PSTN looks like. So I'm going to do a show IP route on this side. And you'll see that it only knows about the dot .1 and the dot .3. So 192.168.1 and 192.168.3. Uh, the dot .1 is really my network, so that way I can telnet into these devices. So that's my uh, back, back end connection to all of the devices. So that's why the dot .1 is on all of them. But uh, really the dot .3, the dot .2 um, are the networks that we're trying to communicate. And then the 120 is my VoIP phones. So again, you can see what's there. Now I'm going to show you what the configuration changes I'm going to add in are. So the first one, voice service VoIP. So we're going to go into the um, VoIP configuration. And we're going to turn on connections. I'm going to allow all the connections. So I'm going to allow H323 to H323. I'm going to allow H323 to SIP. SIP to H323 and SIP to SIP. So I'm just going to turn on all the different connection options we have. Down below this, I have some housekeeping, and that's the voice translation rules. Um, I need this because on my VoIP dial peers, they don't automatically strip digits. So when I set up um, my outbound dialing rule, which I set up a really basic one, not what I would do personally in the lab or in the real world, but for lab demo, it works really well. But for the real world, I would never do it. So this voice translation rule is, is really there to strip off the 9-1. So when my user dials a 9-1 plus the 10 digits, this is just going to strip off the 9 and the 1 and send the 10 digits to the carrier. And you can see I call it PSTN out, so it's going to be um, just a profile, and I'm translating the called phone number. So the voice translation rule and the voice translation profile are really housekeeping. Those aren't part of a cube configuration, but because you may need to do digit manipulation, I include them here so you can see this is what I'm doing within my network, uh, so you have an understanding of why they're there. Down below it, I have my dial peer voice 100 VoIP. And this dial peer is an incoming call dial peer. So this is my inbound dial peer. And I did this separately to show you what's going on to make it so I have an inbound and an outbound to keep it clear. So 100 is basically begins with a 9.t. So anything that comes in from the CME side, which is going to have a 9 as a prefix. So when I dial a 9.1 or if I dial a 9 whatever, um, I would accept that into my cube device. The only thing I'm doing on this is I'm setting DTMF relay on here, H245 alpha, and I've got no VAD. So I'm not doing voice activated uh, detection. Um, so I turn off VAD because we never like to use VAD. Real world or lab, turn off VAD. VAD is bad. The next dial up here, because I want to do both uh, SIP and H323, I was more specific on this dial up here. So dial peer 110, I have a destination pattern of begins with 911 and ends. So I'm being very, very specific. Only when someone dials 911 will this dial peer be used. This is an inbound dial peer at this point. The session protocol I call out next. So this is a SIP dial peer. So I now have an inbound SIP. And because I wanted to also show you that you can do this all in one, I have a session target. Because on the session target, I'm going to go out to IPv4 192.168.3.2, which is my uh, gateway on the other side. So this is my PSTN side. The incoming called, again, this is how we bring it in. Destination pattern goes out. And here I've got a DTMF relay of RTP NTE, which is what we typically would use for a SIP endpoint. So we're going to communicate SIP and then no VAD again. No VAD, we always turn VAD off. So you can see. I've got one dial here where I used it as strictly an incoming called. The other one, I've got a destination pattern and an incoming called, so it's both an in and an out. So 110 would be used as an inbound as well as an outbound. Um, inbound is determined by the incoming called number. The outbound is by destination pattern and then an IPv4 session target. That's how I get my outbound. So um, the next one down, doing dial up here voice 200. This one has a destination pattern of 4. 08555 2 dot 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 dollar. So this is my incoming from the PSTN. So this would be my incoming from my service provider, so my outside world, whoever my carrier is, Verizon, AT&T, 
um, any one of the number of companies out there today that offers SIP trunking to you. This would be my inbound from the outside world, or the, my outbound from the outside world. It's going to go to my communications manager, Express in this case, which is 192.168.2.2. Again, this one is set up as an H323. This is not a SIP. This is H323. There's no session protocol. This is an H323 going outbound towards my C CUCME. Now my voice uh, 1000, this is going to be um, my outgoing to the PSTN. I'm putting my translation profile on. Remember, I want to strip off that 9-1. So I'm putting that on here. I'm saying the destination pattern is a 9. It's a SIP. And it's going over to the PSTN. And then here's my inbound coming incoming called from my carrier, my service provider, is 2,000. So this is my in from my carrier, my out to my carrier. Then I've got my out to my uh, communications manager express, my in and out for 911, and my inbound from uh, CME going back to the um, uh, uh, cube device. So that's all the configs it's going to take to make this work. And it's real simple. I'm just going to copy all of them. Just do a control C on that. I'm going to go out bring up my cube device. So on screen we've got the cube device now and I'm going to do a config T. Paste those configs. Do an end. And now I can do a show run. And now you'll see that I've got my voice translation rule in place. I've got my voice service VoIP with my allow connections at the top there. That gets me through my cube. So this is what sets up my IP to IP gateway. I'm allowing those connections. I've got uh, my dial peers showing up here at the bottom, 100, 110, 200, 1,000, and 2,000. And we now have the ability to place calls. So I'm just going to do a write mem on this real quick. Hate to lose configs, so always do a write. Now, moments ago, when I first dialed, you heard when I pressed the 911, it didn't ring. Now we have ringing, and we have established a, a phone call through the cube. So now that I have the, uh, the phone call established through Cube, I'm going to do some of those show commands I mentioned earlier. So some of the things that I threw out earlier were show, SIP, call. So my SIP call, you can see here that I've got a SIP call in place. And this call is state active. Calling number is 408-555-2001. So that's my calling number. So it was originated on my CME side. My called number is 911. So you can see here that I've got... Um, I call out to 911, my source IP address, where it started off, where it went to. Stream is active, shows my codec. DTMF, RTP, NTE, so everything's here. Next piece, again, the other side of the call, because this is a two-step process, SIP on both sides, one side and the other side. So we have both sides of the call showing up here, again, from 408-555-2001 to 911. So you can see that that shows up. There's my show SIP call. So that's one way to see what's going on with the call. Show H323 gateway H225. You can see that I have setups. So I have some calls set up in process. I've placed some calls on here. These were done previously because obviously I haven't used an H323 call on this call. It was just a SIP call. But I did this earlier show H323 gateway and this just gives me more details this is going to give me all the information about what was going on within the call so you'll get a lot more information um, if you just do the show H323 gateway command you'll see that other things that we can do here again show voice call status I mentioned you would not see any call status on the cube device and there it is you won't see it I do a show VoIP RTP connections and you'll see that I've got two connections. So this is basically showing again the call legs. Call ID, destination call ID, call ID, destination call ID. So I have two active RTP connections. One going from SIP to my CME on my side, one going over to my PSTN. So there's my two calls. Now the other thing that I can do with this is I can do a detail. And here you'll see that it gives me a little more information than I got before. Um, when I get the detail, it does show me some detail about who called and calling information. So my calling information shows here, calling, and who did I call? 911. 
So you get a little more information when you do that detail on here. Uh, the other thing that we can also see is the show um, call active voice. And this one gets pretty lengthy, so I'm going to just scroll through it real quick because I can do the same thing with brief. And the brief gives me a lot less information. Um, so it shows SIP call legs 2, H323 call legs 0, call agent controlled call legs. It gives me details about the call, when it was originated, um, who originated it, who called. There's a 911 showing up there, so I know that the call went to 911. So there's a lot of information here. Uh, more information if you do it without the brief, um, so you can see a lot about what's going on. I'm also going to bring up the CME. So this is my CME device, and I'm going to do a show SIP call on this device. And what you'll see on this one is that I have one. So I'm going to scroll up there. I have one SIP call leg. Why? Because this is the CME. It's the originator. So it's originating the SIP call. Uh, if we do a show, um, I won't bother with the H323 because we're not doing it right now. Voice call status. You'll see on this one I do get an active call because this is a CME device and it has, it's holding or, or maintaining controlling that active call for my telephone here on the CME side. So you will see information on that one. When I do uh, the other options, the show VoIP RTP connections, and this one it shows one RTP connection. So you'll see that it has one half of the, the conversation. So those are the commands that you'll be able to do on your side and be able to see different things happening. So I'm going to hang up the SIP call, and I'm going to bring up a, an H323 call next. So this time what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and dial the other phone, which is a 91. 972-555-1212. So now this call should be an H323 to SIP. So I'm going to go back over to my cube first. And on the cube device, I'm going to do the same command. So I'm going to do a show SIP call. So you'll see that I've got the SIP call active and going. And I'm going to do a show H323 gateway H225. And you'll see my calls and facilitation of H323 calls. Uh, again, I'll do the uh, show voice call status, which again gives me nothing. I'm not going to get any call status because I'm not in control of the call. Um, the calls are being controlled by the CME on the ends. Uh, when I do a show VoIP RTP connections, I still see that I've got two call connections. So that's how I know I have the two calls happening. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the um, detail. Now you can see what the calls are. So it gives me more details about the call. So the number that I called, 919725551212, who was the caller, the 408-555-2001. So I can see the calls and where they're going, how they're being handled, who's in control of them. It's, a, it's the RTP uh, function. Um, and then I've got the show call active voice. And again, I can do this with brief. just so I can see what the call legs look like. Now here what you'll like about this one is, again, I can see my SIP call at the top telephone call legs. I have a SIP call and an H323 call. So it tells me what I'm actually dealing with. I have two call legs. One's running SIP, one's running H323. Pretty cool stuff, right? Let's go back over to the CME, and I can do, again, the same types of commands, show SIP call. And I'll get nothing on H3 on the this side because I'm running H323 currently. So there, there's no ability to see the SIP calls because I didn't initiate a SIP call. I use the H323 dial peer. If I do the show H323 gateway, I'll get details about the setup of the H323 calls. So I can see all the details about calls that were sent, received, and how they function within the system. So it gives you that ability to see what's going on within your calls. Um, again, I can continue on with the show voice call status. And I see that I have a call active, which is good. I should. If I do a show VoIP uh, RTP connections, I see that I've got one connection. Again, I'm on the um, uh, CME side, so I should only see one because I originated this one. And when I do the detail of it, I get more information. Uh, again, as you're working through and troubleshooting, being able to get detail helps. So one of the things I always recommend is if you're not sure of the commands, just hit a question mark at the end. So when you do the show um, VoIP 
uh, VoIP, RTP, connections unit, question mark, and it'll tell you that you can do detail, which gives you a little more information than you have before, which is a good thing. And then the uh, show, call, active, voice, brief, and it shows me my call legs again. I have one H323 call leg. So that's the calls going back and forth between them. The other thing that I want to do is on the cube, I'm going to go ahead and make sure I got terminal monitor turned on. And then I'm going to do the debug. So I'm going to do a debug dial peer voice in out. Uh, well, it helps if I spell it right. Debug. Uh, my bad. Voice dial peer. So I've now turned on debugging so I can watch those dial peers uh, as they come in and out. So I'm going to try that call again. And now you can see with the debug, what happened on that, I can see the call number. So I have calling number shows up real quick right here. So I have my calling number showing up on screen, the 408-555-2001. Who did I call? 919725551212. Where did that where did that go? What did I do with it? Well, if I look down below, I keep looking down through the system, I see result success. Dial peer was dial peer 100. So that's my incoming dial peer. So it matched on incoming, and it says dial peer 100 is where it matched to. And then when we look down, we should see that we went outbound. So down underneath, as we keep looking down, we'll find at the very bottom, we have our matched outbound dial peer, which was 1,000. So that's how we got from point A to point Z using debugs. And I'm going to turn off debugging because I don't like to leave it on. Being a good engineer, I try to avoid leaving those things on on my system. So that's basically the, uh, the extent of what I wanted to show today in regards to uh, doing the demo, um, just showing that you know, I can establish calls through that cube. The cube does terminate the, uh, the um, calls, the RTP streams. You saw that uh, with my um, show of the, uh, the SIP as well as the show VoIP RTP connections. So at this point, what I want to do is open it up to, uh, to questions, and I'm going to try to go through and find all the questions and make sure I've answered everybody's questions uh, within the system. And it looks like we have tons of them. So what I want to do is uh, just see if I can open that up to, uh, to questions. Bear with me as I look through the list for everybody's questions. Uh, I'm going to stop showing my screen so that way I can bring up the question and answers here. Okay, well, it appears I'm having some trouble getting the question section to pop up. Ah, oh, there it is. Getting used to the uh, the interface here. I haven't used uh, the GoToMeeting in a little while, so. Uh, are there enhancements for monitoring status of active connections above the usual show, call, active voice? Um, uh, obviously, you can... You can um, do the uh, debug on the dial peer to see that what's going on within dial peers as calls come in and go out. Um, I've used that uh, to you know figure out what's going on with calls or problems within the system. Um, as far as monitoring the status of active connections, uh, the show commands are typically the the only way to to monitor those unless you're using third-party applications or um, one of Cisco's uh, monitoring tools for that. Uh, built into the actual iOS. Uh, there's no easy way to do it. It would really be off of the uh, the, the show commands that uh, you'd be finding information and be able to view that. Um, and uh, I had a question just about being able to view this later. Um, yes, you will be able to view it later. I am recording the session, and that will get posted up on the system. Um, So you will be able to, once I've posted the, uh, the recording, you will be able to come in and watch that uh, at a later time. 
Uh, let's see. All right, there is a question uh, just regarding, you know, for the CCIE lab exam without, uh, you know, breaching NDA, what types of questions could they ask us on CUBE? Um, similar to what I just did uh, today, it's uh, really as far as what can you be asked to do on CUBE. Um, obviously, uh, you want to know how to set up CUBE, which is pretty simple. And for safety's sake, I, of course, would set up all four options, you know, your uh, H323 to H323, H323 to SIP, SIP to H323, and SIP to SIP is all your connection options, so you don't have to worry. You've got them all configured. Uh, the difficulty comes in, just as uh, everybody knows, on the CCIE voice exam. It's not the idea of uh, the question, per se, being difficult. It's the 400 little minor details that they will not mention to you that you have to figure out for yourself, uh, such as uh, asking you to change your caller ID, um, calling caller ID, meaning your A and I. So having to manipulate your ANI uh, within the call, having to manipulate the DNS or the phone number that you called to, um, having to manipulate a call to use um, PSTN as backup to your uh, cube solution. So if your cube call were to fail, backing that up with PSTN. Um, DSPs, the, they could uh, ask you to uh, make sure that the local call were a G711, but your carrier is only accepting G729, so you have to know how to uh, transcode within it. And again, that's that's not difficult. First off, you just have to have DSPs on your device. Configure your DSPs as transcoders. And now the fun part, set up telephony service because there's no way to register DSPs to Cube in and of itself. So you're going to have to actually make that Cube gateway act like CME. So you're going to have to turn on telephony service and make it act like CME and register, you, register your DSPs to CME itself. That will allow it to, in, to uh, invoke transcoding when it needs it for Cube. So really the, the basics, they're going to ask you to do some, some basic cube configuration. Um, and what could they ask you to get more difficult? Well, think about it. I mean, there's lots of different little pieces. Um, media flow through or flow around, uh, transparency and the codec selection. So there's some things of that nature that they could ask to trip you up um, as usual. So uh, I don't believe I've breached any NDA there, especially since... Uh, uh, you know, I haven't taken the current version of the exam. I passed my CCIE on the previous version. Uh, could you explain DTMF relay, RTP, NTPE, uh, digit drop, and H2, H245? Um, again, uh, DTMF uh, relay, R, the RTP, um, NTE option on there, that's what we typically use for SIP. That is a, a standard option that uh, Cisco Call Manager uses for SIP. And we would want to use whatever matches our, our service provider, so our carrier. Typically, your carrier will tell you what uh, DTMF relay they want used, and you'll use that. The digit drop means that if the system were to see that command coming um, in, if, it's, if you've configured it with digit drop, if a digit were actually in the RTP stream, it would drop the digit in the stream because it's going to do it using RTP and NTE. Uh, the last piece being H245 means that we're going to allow it to negotiate one or the other, so you can set it up to with multiples on that line. If the system sees multiples on the line, then it will negotiate to whatever the other side wants. Um, so DTMF relay uh, gives you some optional choices. Uh, again, the digit drop is just saying that if it sees it in stream, it's going to drop the digit, um, so it's not seen as part of the stream. Can a firewall be used instead of SBC? Uh, you can put a firewall in place. You can run the iOS firewall on the same device. You can run a, a PIX or an ASA firewall in place, uh, some third-party firewall. The key is you're going to have to open up ports. Um, now, the good news and the bad news, uh, your SIP ports are pretty well known. Uh, the bad news is your RTP ports are a huge range. So you're going to have to open up the huge UDP range for RTP because you've got to communicate R RTP across this. Um, which isn't such a bad ordeal uh, because, again, you're not sharing your routing with the other side. So as far as your carrier goes, your service provider, um, it's pretty easy. You can say anything from this IP address to this IP address within this UDP range, allow, and it's not a big ordeal because really it's 
between the two IP addresses, your cube device to their SIP device, and that's it. Because that's the only thing you're ever going to talk to and the only thing they're ever going to talk to. Your cube is what allows them to talk to everything else. Again, it's, it's terminating the RTP stream. Um, so you can make this very safe and secure, and you can use uh, NATing with the solution as well. Um, you had a single IP on the cube box. Uh, uh, on the drawings, I may have had a single IP. Obviously, the IP address on the cube box would be um, for both directions. So typically, you'd have an IP on the on the um, each side of the cube. So one going to your carrier, one going to your internal, and you don't share your internal with the carrier. So the carrier has no idea what's going on, um, what's inside your network. Most carriers provide you with um, an outside IP address. The one thing that Cisco does mention about using Cube is that you can utilize Cube with an internet connection. So your service provider can provide you your internet and a SIP trunk on the same connection. So say you get a, a 5 meg ETH from your carrier. You could do that. Personally, I'm against that because I would prefer that we, we keep our, our SIP trunk on a separate SIP connection that it's a data connection strictly for SIP, strictly for phone calls. My QoS on it is very clean, my carrier is very clean on it, and my security on it becomes much easier because I'm not trying to secure the internet. Um, I'm just dealing with a SIP trunk where I have known SIP device on the other side. So that's, that's how I would uh, uh, view that. Um, does Cube allow for authentication? There is some authentication methods to it. Uh, that was shown on one of the slides. Authentication is an option within Cube. Uh, gatekeeper cube configuration. Uh, I, I won't have time to go over gatekeeper and cube. That's the um, via zones. So within cube, within gatekeeper, you can use via zones, and the via zone can go off to cube and terminate the streams there. Uh, that topic would take me several hours to go over and to really dig into to demonstrate and and give you more details on it. Uh, that could be something I can do at a later date and time where I just focus on the via since we've covered cube as part of this. I wouldn't cover cube again. I would just deal with the gatekeeper cube uh, configuration. Um, so in actuality, thank you for that option, Bob. Uh, I will use that as a future um, one of these webinars and go over that uh, in the future because that, that's a perfect uh, topic. And this cube topic leads right into that gatekeeper in via out via um, communication conversation. So that will work really well. Uh, 2621 XM way I can use. Uh, the, the 2621. Um, does support it. My cube gateway today, I didn't show you all what my cube was today. My cube for today was actually a 1700 series router. Um, why did I use a 1700 series router? Well, that's what I happen to have in my uh, my home lab. Uh, I've got a pretty healthy uh, lab of equipment, but I don't have you know 2900s and 3900s laying around, so I use a 1700 series. Uh, they perform um, obviously less capabilities, less performance. If you're looking for CCIE lab practice, uh, a 1700 series router will do it. A 2600 series router will do it. Just have to make sure you've got the right iOS version on there and the right iOS um, feature set so you have the feature set that will allow you to run it. Uh, you can also practice Cube for those of you who use Dynamips. Um, you can use Dynamips practice Cube as well. Again, it will. Uh, it, it will do everything that does not require a DSP. So as long as you don't need DSPs, you can run it in Dynamips. Um, will the second session target will be to ISP address or internal address? Uh, obviously, we have an inbound and outbound dial peers. So the outbound dial peers always have to point to the device that you're trying to get to. So you'd have an inbound dial peer that would just receive or accept the inbound call from the service provider. You can reuse and have the same dial peer be your outbound dial peer. So it's up to you how you want to do your dial peers on that. But as far as the um, session target, yes, the session target uh, on your outbound going to the service provider would be the IP address that they provide to you. Uh, do you need a PAC key and licensing? Um, if you're using the 2900, 3900 series, they do require uh, licensing on them. Uh, the 15.x code does. I know Cisco has backed away from some of the packs. I'm not sure if Cube still requires it. I know some of the other iOS feature sets, um, Cisco had backed away from requiring the license keys on them. Uh, the last I read on uh, Cube was it still required a license, 
but uh, that may have changed or may be changing. Um, but uh, for the most part, the way they were working was definitely on the 15.x code. It was requiring PACs and license keys. Um, so you do need to get your PACs and licenses. Uh, I, that's one that you just need to double check because I know Cisco did back back away from that. They were having some some issues with customers and, and whatnot, um, having all the services licenses and the, the PAC keys uh, for feature sets on those uh, newer 2900, 3900, uh, 15.x code versions. Uh, why incoming and destination pattern on the same dial peer? Uh, the way I was doing it, I was just showing that you have the option to do it on both. Um, it's not necessary that you do. Uh, some people like to keep it straight in their head, so they keep them separate. So they do in inbound peers and outbound peers just so it stays straight. Um, it's up to you. It's a, it's a personal preference. You don't have to. Um, you can. The thing to remember, and one of the reasons I showed it separately, is to remind people that uh, the session target with an IPv4 has nothing to do with the inbound. Uh, some people get confused and think that, it's going to match by the source IP address of who's initiating the H323 conversation that has nothing to do with it. Uh, I've got one of my articles, my first article, I go over exactly how we select our inbound dial peers. And the incoming called is the first thing that it matches. If, if there's a match to incoming called, it's going to use it. Um, so that's the first option. Destination pattern will match the ANI on the next option, uh, so on and so forth. But you know, inbound and outbound, it's up to you how you want to program. It's just a personal choice. Um, call be coming from inside the network to the provider with pattern 911, but not likely to see incoming pattern 911 from PSTN to inside. So curious on this dial peer config. Um, let me see if I can show my screen again, and I'll bring up my my config here. On the dial peer config, um, I have a dial peer uh, 911, and this one is an inbound from CME and an outbound to the service provider. So that's why I have an inbound and outbound. On CME, I would only have one. CME would have a single outbound dial peer. But because this is on Cube, Cube does have an inbound 911. It's inbound coming from CME or call manager. If you were doing an H323 or a SIP trunk to call manager, the Cube would have an inbound 911 coming from your internal network. And it would have an outbound 911 going to the service provider. So I have these just happen to be, I combined the two together. So that's why I have that. Uh, just another question in regards to why I combine dial peers. Um, again, on uh, why I combine dial peers, it was just to show that you can. Um, not really any other reason than that, just to show that it is something you can do, um, not that you need to or have to. Uh, Any special consideration in case there is a firewall between the cube and the service provider? Um, the only special considerations that you really have uh, deal with ports, making sure that you have your ports open, such as you can uh, establish RTP. The biggest issue is um, everybody, of course, will think about their SIP ports, and they'll make sure that their SIP is open so SIP can get through. Uh, the bigger issue is your real-time protocol, your RTP streams, uh, because that's a huge range of UDP ports those need to be open to allow that communication as well. So those are the two, two aspects that you have to think about when you do put a firewall in the network. Uh, the DTMF that's most common for SIP, um, that's going to be your RTP NTE. That is your standard for call manager. Um, it uses uh, RTP NTE. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, CUE, Cisco uh, Unity Express, it requires SIP notify. So CUE is SIP notify. Um, as far as the rest of the world, typically RTP NTE. Uh, standard DTMF for H323 is H245 alphanumeric. So DTMF relay for H323 would be H245 dash alphanumeric. So really, if you're looking at uh, what I showed today, I used, in my demo, I used the standards of the industry, what most people will use. And definitely you'll want to use unless someone tells you otherwise. If you're told different by your carrier, use whatever they say. If they say nothing, then use the RTP NTE for SIP and H245 alphanumeric for H323. Um, uh, 
Uh, as far as there's a question here, uh, will you be conducting the mock boot camp also? Uh, I am the lead instructor for um, voice, and I will be teaching uh, pretty much all of the CCIE voice level um, courses for CC boot camp. Uh, not to say that uh, there isn't potential that I'll be teaching one class and we'll have another instructor teaching this, those classes. Um, but typically, the classes uh, that CC boot camp offers, I will be teaching. Uh, again, I try to uh, bring in some of the real world as well as uh, lab environment um, into the classroom, so I hope that uh, you all appreciate those opportunities. Uh, after the class, the video, um, there's a question about how will you uh, access the video uh, of this session. Uh, that will be posted online, so you'll see that there. All right, with that, I'm going to uh, 